All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're now in our Exodus study. And um, last week we looked at <clears throat> the consecration of Aaron and his sons uh, as they were set aside, set apart, hallowed for the service of Yah. Um, and how important that is that we be set apart you know as we are given his words to deliver to people that don't know him how we have to be different how we have to be peculiar how we walk differently talk differently dress differently um, and we saw that play out <clears throat> in aaron and his sons as they were consecrated to be the priests of the nation um we talked about the offerings, the daily offerings, the offerings of what would atone for sin. And this week, we're going to go into um, the incense, the altar of incense, the ransom, the bronze laver, um, and the anointing oil. So we're going to be discussing these things and kind of seeing how they play out in our lives as well. Um, so we'll take each topic um, so the discussion of the altar of incense um, let's take that first so we'll look at the first 10 verses who would like to read the first 10 verses and for the, for the newcomers Whoever reads um, the passage gets the first opportunity to uh, speak on what they see or what um, stands out to them um, as part of the discussion. So um, the first 10 verses of, of, of Exodus chapter 30, who would like to take those first 10 verses? I can read, brother. Thank you, brother JP. He says, um, Exodus chapter 30, and thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of shittim wood, thou, oh, shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it by the two corners thereof. Upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it. And they shall be for places for the staves to bear withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before Yahuwah throughout your generations. He shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, Neither shall you pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Um, I think we spoke about something similar. I want to say, uh, I'm not sure, but... The shittim wood and 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 the um, what kind of tree is that? Like I, I haven't even looked or nothing like that, so I wouldn't be able to say. But because um, it's this particular uh, acacia, go ahead. acacia wood, the tree. Oh, okay. So it's a, I, you know, it's a, it's interesting that because Yahuwah chooses these certain items, you know, and he, he chose this, and then again we, I think we spoke about something similar, but 
you know, he tells, he, he says to make it out of that wood and then to overlay it with gold, you know? So it's not just like a, a pure molten gold and, and solidified just by gold, but it's actually the wood and it has the gold on it. And, and to me, a wood, um, you know, again, this is my mind is, is life. You know, wood has life in it, you know, even when you cut the tree down, it's still a it's still a product of something that was life. And so it's interesting though that um that's what I was seeing. Go ahead. Yeah. Um the 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 gold um uh would would also reinforce and strengthen um this altar. Um there's a lot, there's a lot of things in this passage, man. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'll i let other people speak um, before I, before I go. So, so what else do we see here um, in the first 10 verses? For those that just came in, we, we just read the first 10 verses, specifically speaking of the altar of incense. Brother Yakub. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, brother. You know, as uh, as JP was talking about the wood and the gold, something clicked with me. As uh, the, 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 the human life, it's more of, of wood. And uh, wood is prone to... It can be eaten by termites, so it has to be reinforced. The wood has to be reinforced. And the spirit of Yahuwah being the pure gold that covers this wood, this, this delicate wood, and it is reinforced. So the, 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 the pure gold in itself would have to show that only something pure, as pure as the spirit of Yahuwah can cover the delicateness of the spirit of man. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, just in the sense of how gold is used as, as an example of explaining the purification process of even us, you know, how it's purified and the dross is scraped off and it gets to its most purest form. Um, and also those that are crafting it, because we talked about uh, the, the people that were uh, putting these things together, the seamstress, the to the blacksmiths, the goldsmiths for this for that matter, the bronze smiths as we're going to read later, um, uh, the, the, the the lumberjacks <laughs> cutting down the acacia trees were all sanctified and and set apart and gifted in a special way to perform these duties for for Yahuwah, um, in the same way that um, or likened in the same way that. Uh, Aaron and his sons, Aharon and his sons were set apart to be the priests. Um, so um, all of these things taking place uh, as we're looking at um, the crafting of the altar of incense. What else do we see? Incense. What 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 are incense used for? What are, what what is the purpose of them? To be burned, right? For 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 a, a fragrance, a smell, right? So this this particular uh, picture here, um, I think, is seen if we look at verse. Six, it says, and you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet you. What is that telling us there? All right, let's 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 do this another way. Let's, let's look at a couple scriptures. Um, 
pertaining to incense and what it represents. Uh, David says in, in Psalm 141 uh, verse two, let my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. So prayer is likened to incense and how this is done before the veil. And that veil has significance, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. Revelations 5, 8 tells us the incense were like prayers of Yah's people. The incense were the prayers of Yah's people. So here we see this setting as the prayers go before the veil in which Yahuwah resides. And we know in Matthew 27, 51, what does it tell us? That the veil was ripped from top to bottom. Meaning what? That we now have access to Yah through Yahushua Messiah, because that was the, at the moment of his, his death, right? So we see this picture of the incense being before the veil, which covers the Holy of Holies, our prayers going before and, and only through Yahushua. That is the only name that we will be saved by and how that connects, how that uh, matches what we're reading here. So it, it's imperative that we look at these things and we make sure we understand the symbolism, you know, understand, you know, that we're, that it, you know, JP pulls out a lot that, you know, to the, to the letter, these things had to be done the exact same way, but what do they represent? You know, they represent us. They represent the son. They represent the father and see, you know, we look at the intricacy and the way that the veil was made, the thickness of it. And we read in Acts that many priests came to came to be believers who probably witnessed the veil being torn from top to bottom, knowing that there was no need for an intercessor other than Yahushua Messiah, that we have direct access to the Father now. So all of these things being lightened and, or highlighted, I should say, in this particular passage. What else we see? I got a question in that statement you just made about the uh, many people seeing the veil being ripped. What wouldn't the veil wasn't that like on the inner in the inner parts of the of the tabernacle? I didn't say many, I said the priests. Oh, the priests. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad I clarified that because I was I, I know them are the only ones that yeah. can see something like that. <laughs> Right, so, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I prefaced it by saying many priests came to know or came into the faith. You know, yeah, I'm tired, brother. I missed I miss what you said. So, oh, that's, that's, right. that's all right, brother. That's all right, brother. <laughs> <clears throat> no, nah, but that, 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 that's a, that's a great opportunity to, to understand, you know, what we're reading here and the significance of what happens later, right, in scripture. Um, JP. <clears throat> and, and just uh, going to verse 10, because um, I, I mean, I know that we had, it says, you know, this is a, a incense only, but this is for incense, you know, but in verse 10, he says, and Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements once in a year you shall make an atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto Yahuwah and um, we can see some, you know, of course, Leviticus 16 speaks about the Day of Atonement, right. but he goes on to, to show that that time of what um, Aaron is going to perform. Uh, 1612 speaks about it. He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before Yahuwah and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small and bring it within the veil. And then he goes on to speak about that because I was just wondering, I, I had to look into it to see what. Um, particular day he had to do this and that was the particular day and so that was that was an interesting uh situation um because I, I think about messiah and uh when he was crucified and and that time um uh, when that time was what time period you know um being that he was our atonement you know he was that atonement for us so just thinking about the time, the time frame. 
But yeah, absolutely. That would have been the day of atonement, Le uh, Leviticus 16. Uh, you know, what's interesting about that chapter you mentioned, it also, it not only does it <laughs> talk about the day of atonement, but it talks about all of the utensils that were being cleansed um, for this particular, you know, ceremony. You know, each, each thing had to be consecrated. Each thing had to be set apart and holy, cleansed in a particular way. Um, the washing represented, you know, the cleansing, the purification process of everything that was used, the knives, the, the ladles, the, 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 the ladles, you know, all of the, the utensils, all of the, everything had to be cleansed in that particular way. So great, great chapter to, uh, to tie into here, because that's exactly what it's referring to, um, the Day of Atonement. Um, I saw Brother Nene, you wanted to say something? Yeah, more of a question. Uh, what is the implication of verse 9 or what do what do we understand from verse 9? Because later on they come and say the two sons of Aaron are offering a strange fire. So what does it exactly mean? Do not offer strange incense on it. Strange or a grain of fire. Yeah. yeah, strange could mean common. It could also mean um, uh, ordinary, unsanctified, you know. So so that's what that would mean. So what's the implication to us as believers? Um, verse 9 says... You shall not offer strange incense, common incense, ordinary incense on it, or burnt offering or grain offering, which is also a meat offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. So it was specifically um, this in, in this instance, in this specific epoch of time was written because only what was what was crafted to be in that particular instance, as we're going to read later, how the incense was made up, the, 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 the different um, uh, spices that were used to make it, that was the only thing that can be burned on it. Um, the implication for us, um, that's a good question. Anyone want to take a stab at that? JP? <clears throat> um, I was just thinking, uh, uh, you know, I'm, let me just, I'll just say what's on my mind. Um, <laughs> the time, because I was thinking about this strange fire or strange incense and um, going back to Leviticus chapter 10, it <laughs> says, one. yeah, in verse one, where we see that <laughs> The two sons, they go and they put these, it says, and Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them in his censer and put fire thereon and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before Yahuwah, which he commanded them not. And so I, I, I was thinking it has to do with our disobedience, mm. you know, not going and doing exactly the way Yahuwah has set it forth. Um, and just, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, we see that in the, even in the new Testament, we see that Paul's like, don't come with vain repetitions. Like this is not good. Like this is not the way we are to pray, but we see people doing that today and they're coming with vain repetitions mm -hmm. and thinking that it's, it's catching Yahoo's attention more because they're saying it 20 times. Right. But that's not his way, the way he said it. And so I was thinking in that sense for us today, Yahuwah, this is the way Yahuwah wants it. This is how we set it forth. Go about it that way. And I really, I'm really, you know, pondering on what the brother Nene was speaking on, how this applies to us. Um, but that's what I, I, that's kind of my, where I was going with it though. Absolutely. So, so 
great, great passage to tie in because that's exactly a direct response to his instruction here. They they end up dying, right? Remember, these were these were chosen men of Yah to be in the Levitical priesthood. Chosen, but yet they disobeyed Yah. And what happens? You know, they're taken out, they're cut off. Cut off a lot of times means to be put to death, right? So in this particular instance, the same implication it has for them, it has for us to follow Yah without equivocation, to follow him without interruption. You know, we talked earlier about having a true voice of Yah versus speaking something that is not of him. You know, we are to follow his instructions to a T. We don't make up our own instructions. We don't look in scripture and say, well, we don't have to do that because this is thus and so. No, this is what the scripture tells us to do. We are not to put strange incense or anything other than what he says put here. This is about obedience and following his instructions without question. So, JP. Yeah, and the, and the word itself, you know, I, was, I wanted to look up that word <clears throat> strange, excuse me. <clears throat> and it means, it says zor, um, a primitive root to turn aside, especially for lodging. Hmm. Um, hence, it says to be a foreigner, strange, profane. And then it says specifically um, active participle uh, to commit adultery. So, you know, it's that deep. It's that deep to to come with something different. You know what I mean? So it ties into what we were talking about earlier as well, right? Um, you know, the broad sense of the understanding of the meaning of the word adultery in that it is doing something that is against Yah, basically. Doing something that is against his Torah. Remember, these are instructions at this point being given to Moshe for the people to do. He is to follow them. They are to follow what he says. Um, and if not, they will be cut off as we'll see later. So um, hopefully that answers your question, Yaakov. Oh, no, I mean, um, Nene, uh, you had your hand raised again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, something that has come to me right now. I don't know if we can tie this from the presentation JP has made. Okay. I don't know if we can make this into a relationship. Now, we understand that our bodies are now the temple of the Ruach, right? And uh, when Yahushua was speaking to us, he was uh, cautioning us that we are part of one body, right? We are, he is the vine, we are the branches. So it's an it's an all interconnected thing. So in when the early church was beginning, we say Ananias and Sapphira, they're coming to the altar, quote and quote, with words and they're speaking words that are, you know, they're defiling and they're it's, it's, it's not acceptable before. I don't know if we can tie it up with that scenario. Well, yeah, yeah, that, that and, definitely ties into the adulterous um uh, mindset, <clears throat> because remember, adultery had to do with disobeying Yah when it came to his people, right? What were they doing? They were going, they wanted to, what did they do? If you follow Israel, they had, they had a king, they had someone to follow, but what did they want? They wanted to follow kings like the world followed kings. So he gave them kings. Right then, they wanted to do the things that the 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 abominable, abominable people that were he was separating them from. They wanted to do those things. When they had Yah to follow, they went back to Egypt to get to make treaties with their enemies and listen to the counsel of them. Isaiah chapter thirty verses following Yah, they were a continual uh, uh, adulterous people. So the mindset of adultery is completely tied into disobedience. So, so absolutely, um, that all ties in together and in, in, in what we were talking about this morning um, <clears throat> for, 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 the, for that mindset. You shall not 
offer strings incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. That was to be followed without question. There's no other way around that. To do otherwise was to be cut off, was to be put to death. So praise yeah. What else do we see in this first 10 verses? You know, and, and also too, just like how we cannot be, we can't take prayer for granted. If we're likening, if scripture likens prayer to incense, that sweet smelling savor could be the, to, the, the smell of our breath to him as we speak to him in prayer. You know, did you brush your teeth? Did you floss? You know, are you are you cleansed? You know, how are we approaching him? You know, so this is this is uh, you you, you want to talk about direct connection. We want to talk about how does this play out for us? We have to be in a constant mind. You know, it says pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean drive around the neighborhood with your eyes closed. No, it says constantly be in the mindset of prayer and supplication to the Father. In all things, we seek him. You know, every decision, every, um, you know, uh, idea, you know, every business opportunity, every movement of the family from one place to another, all of these things we, we, we take to Yah, you know? You know, we cleanse, you know, we cleanse our mouth, you know, before we speak to him. We want it to be, a sweet smelling savor to him, just as these incense were. So <clears throat> let's keep that in mind as we go forth to try to make sure that we tie in the instructions to what they actually mean, right? Praise God. Go ahead, JP. Yeah. Oh, I just want to mention, my brothers, that. Um, I like what, what the brother Nene brought out with, with uh, Ananias and Sapphira uh, because that was a particular moment that was that was important where what we're seeing in the book of Acts is that they're told a specific thing, just like we're told throughout scripture, specifically what to do. And, and then they went and tried to do it their own way. You know, again, coming to Yahuwah your own way. I'm going to... He's going to accept me the way I am and who I am. And, and it's that mentality that has misled many people, you know, and then they say, you know, I, I'm always, I'm praying, I'm praying, but I'm not, I'm not blessed. Well, you're, you're not choosing life. You know, you're choosing the way of the world and the way the world has created the way you can come to the father, Yahuwah, and, and you can present yourself. But Yahuwah is telling you, no, I want you to come like this. And with Ananias and Sapphira, is like, you're going to do this. You're going to sell all your stuff, and you're going to bring it and put it in this pot. Like, I don't care how much, if it was a million dollars. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how much money it was, you know? But it seemed like it was a lot, like, for that person to have to give up. You know what I mean? Like, in my modern term of my mind, it must have been, like, all their property. Like, who knows? I don't know how much they had or, or what it was, you know? Well, so, I think I think that I think I think to your point, it, it really doesn't matter how much it was. It was the idea that they were deceiving or thought they could get away with holding something back. You know, whether it was two cents, 50 cents or 50 million, they deceived by acting like they were given a lot. But it was a whole, a whole lot more that they should have given to be honest with the direction to what Yah was getting. And what does that remind you of? To me, it reminds me of Cain and Abel because you have a lot of people say, well, he was he was a tiller of the ground and he did. He gave his best fruits. But that's not what Yah told him to do. Right. He told him to slaughter and bring forth a lamb. Right. So. We can never create our own picture. It even goes further back than that. The garden, 
what happened when 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 Adam and Eve partook of the fruit? What did they do? They covered themselves with fig leaves. Yeah, I said, nah, that's not gonna cover you. This is how I cover you. Animal skins. Right? So it is his direction and his direction only. And you know, we fight, we kick against the gold, you know, thinking of my son, you know, when he was a baby, <clears throat> playing with him on the bed and him crawling to the edge of the bed, and me pulling him back, and him kicking and screaming, not realizing that I'm saving him from falling off the edge of the bed. Literally, I'm saving him. Don't do that. <laughs> but you want to do it because you don't understand. You know, and, and how often we don't understand Yah's ways and how we have to be married to trying to learn his ways so that we can follow them. Because he says it's not burdensome for us. It is our life. He calls it that, right? Praise Yah. What else we see there, the first 10 verses? We ready to move on? All right, um, <clears throat> let's look at the next couple of verses. Let's look at, let's read from verse 17. I'm sorry, from verse 11 to verse 16. Who wants to take those verses? Verse 11 to verses 16. Come on, scholars. Go ahead, Nene. <laughs> All right. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, when you take the census of the children of Yasharal to register them, then each one shall give an atonement for his life to Yahweh when you register them so that there is no plague among them when you register them. Everyone among those who are registered is to give this. Half a shekel according to the shekel of the Kodesh bliss, 20 geras being a shekel, the half shekel is the contribution to Yahweh. Everyone passing over to be registered from 20 years old and above gives a contribution to Yahweh. The rich does not give more and the poor does not give less than half a shekel when you give a contribution to Yahweh to make atonement for yourselves. And you shall take the silver for the atonement from the children of Yashara and give it for the service of the tent of appointment. And it shall be to the children of Yashara for their remembrance before Yahweh to make atonement for yourselves. Praise Yah. <clears throat> so what is going on here? A ransom? What are we talking about, y'all? Let's look through it. Anything uh, stand so out to you? Before before I give my take on it, is there somewhere else in the Torah where we are directed not to take a census? The children of Yasharal. Say that again. Is there a place in the Torah where we are directed not to take a census? Um, maybe in Second Samuel. Uh huh. Um, Something happens in Second Samuel, I believe. I have to look it up. But what what do you see here? It's okay, it's okay. Because uh, later on we come and see David taking a census of the uh, fighting men, and a plague strikes them. A plague strikes them. I think it's the case in Second Samuel or Kings. Right, so, right, right. Second Samuel twenty four. Something. Yeah, yeah, true, true. So something that uh, comes out clearly here is Yahuwah doesn't show partiality, right? He doesn't show partiality between the rich, between the poor. Everyone coming before him is equal. And so I'm not so sure about the census thing, but yeah, that, that, that came out clearly. Well, I think, I think here <clears throat> when, when it talks about taking a census, it's it's specifically speaking of um, the men that were 
20 years old and above, um, the men that were able to fight in war and what they had to give um, for the service of Yah's priests, because um, they were taken care of with this. This actually, this, this ransom for atonement actually becomes the temple tax, right? So let's look at the New Testament. Let's look at Matthew chapter uh, 17. Matthew chapter 17, and let's look at verse 24. Um, if you remember this, this is when Peter <clears throat> um, and Yahushua had to pay taxes. Listen to what it says. It says, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Question mark. Peter says, yes. And when he had come into the house, Yahushua anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take custom or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Question mark. Peter said to him, from strangers. Yahushua said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, we often offend them. Go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. So we see um, this temple tax, um, the tradition, continue and Yahushua pays Caesar what is Caesar's, praise Yah, um, so as not to offend. But, you know, the census totally here, dealing with the number of men to know who should give, because the the it wasn't the women that were to give, it wasn't the children that were to give, it was the men that were of able age that could go to war. And we see that in other passages if we if we look at some of the cross references here, um, I think in Numbers um, it speaks of it. And uh, where else? Uh, several different passages. It talks about um, uh, the census. So um, we can add to that as we go along, uh, Brother Yaakov. Um, yes, uh, as pertaining the census, when you mentioned uh, Second Samuel, this is the part where Yahweh is angered by David doing a census, uh, counting all the children of Yasharal. But we also find in Numbers 149, they're given clear instructions. They must not count the tribe of Levi right. or include them in a census of, of the other Israelites. Right. So only the tribe of Levi was not to be counted in any census. So connecting it with the, what, the, the one you had on 2 Samuel, David counts all the children, the tribe of Judah and all of Israel. So that must have included the, the Levites and that, that is what angered Yahuwah. Yeah, the Levites, the Levites were actually <clears throat> the ones that received um, this offering, uh, this ransom that was taken. Um, they were the ones performing all of the, the, the rituals, the sacrifices, um, and they were to be taken care of um, for, for Yah's service. So um, that's what that's talking about. Very good point uh, about what David did um, in 2 Samuel. What else do we see here? A half a shekel uh, from from what I looked at was about 50 cents. Um, and it, 
it's interesting that no matter how much money you made, everyone had to give the same thing. Go ahead, JP. Yeah, I was, that's what I was going to mention. Um, and it says um, in verse 14, um, it says, shall give an offering unto Yahuwah. Like this is a, an offering unto Yahuwah, this, this half shekel. And like you had mentioned in verse 15, which I, I found that interesting. Um, you're only going to give this exact amount for that offering. Um, and then at the end of 15, it says, um, when they give an offering unto Yahuwah to make an atonement for your souls, you know, and that's, it's just interesting because we, we tend to, to stray away from that understanding of, um, cause here it's like, you're, you're giving this money for an offering for the atonement of your souls. And I, I just, I don't, you know, well, you it's, about, it's, it's, it's not. So, all right. So, so this can, this can be confusing. Um, but <clears throat> it shall appoint it. Look, look. All right. Let's continue reading. For atonement for yourselves. Verse 16. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it to the service of the tabernacle of meeting that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before Yahuwah to make an atonement for yourself. So this is actually going to support the Levites who cared for the tabernacle. That's basically, it's for the service of what they're performing for you. Because remember the day of atonement, they atone for everyone, right? The whole nation. So, so this half a shekel, was to support and take care of the Levites. Um, but it can be confusing, like they got to pay for their atonement, like they're, they're paying for it. But that's not the, the correct view of what, it's, what it is, um, if that makes sense. If not, we can look at it further. All right. Um, All right, let's look at the next. Uh, do we see anything else there? All right, let's move on. So let's look at verse. Um, we're going to talk about the bronze laver now. So this this particular um, this this is a particularly um, interesting portion of scripture. So let's go from verse 17 to verse 21. Read from verse 17 to verse 21, anyone? Well, I'll read it if nobody wants to read it. Yeah, go ahead, brother. I guess people don't want to read today. Yeah, Cobb, you gonna read, brother? Uh, you, you you take it on, I'll take on the next one because you okay. you'd already come up. So you said 17 to 24? 21. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What book are we in? The book of Exodus. Long. Okay, thanks. Exodus, Exodus chapter 30. Yes, yes, sir. All right, it says, And Yahuwah spoke unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not, and it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. Praise God. Praise God. <clears throat> Man, I just, I don't know. I kind of, I, I see it in this way of, um, you know, again, just applying it to my life. 
um, being washed clean again before I come to the altar, you know, being washed clean and not being dirty, not in the physical world, you know, not in the physical. I mean, you could probably take it there, but, but I'm looking at it like my my internal, you know what I'm saying, my my soul. And if I'm not washed clean by Hamashiach, then and then I'm I'm dirty and coming to the altar again with that strange fire and not coming the way he wants it. So you know that that's very important what you just said. And you know, literally down to the T to what you just said. I'm I'm gonna break this down for you. So let me ask you a question. What, and this is for everyone, what did they make the bronze laver from? Where did they get the bronze from? Anybody? I think it was the women's jewelry, possibly. Close. Okay. Exodus, very close, Sister Lisa. If you look at Exodus chapter 38, verse 8, it says, he made the laver of bronze and the base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So the women had bronze mirrors. They make this bronze laver. So, so what a bronze laver is. Does everyone know what a laver looks like? It's basically a, 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 a big bowl on a pedestal and it's filled with water, cleansing water, right? So JP just said that it made him think of being cleansed, you know, not so much on the outside, but on the inside, right? So let's look at the passage. It says, um, for Aaron and his sons, verse 19, shall wash their hands and their feet with water. So their hands, you know, they're doing all kinds of things with their hands. Um, so they have to wash their hands, physically wash their feet. And remember they wore sandals. So they very often had to wash their feet because their sand, feet got dirty from, from the sand, from the dirt, from the ground. You know, that's why, you know, the, the foot washing ceremonies um, were specifically needed because their feet were dirty, you know. Um, you know, there's a whole nother thing with that that I won't get into, but um, so they're physically cleansing themselves. But watch this. As they, as they bend down to wash their hands in the laver, Mirrors were made with bronze so they can literally see themselves so that they know what they look like, whether it be a physical cleansing or an opportunity to what? Look themselves in the mirror, have an inter introspection, have self-examination before they set, step before the Lord, before Yahuwah to do service. Do y'all see that? So literally, each priest would have an opportunity to visually examine himself and introspect on his life, the cleansing of his life, being fit and consecrated for the service of Yahuwah. So there's a great picture drawn here for us, you know, as we do things so-called in the name of Yah. You know, we talked earlier about, you know, many will say, you know, master, master, haven't I done these things in your name? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Why? Because you were not cleansed. You were not doing it in my name because what came out of your mouth was contrary to what my Ruach had in store for you to be said at that particular time. So this, this bronze laver, this, um, the picture of them washing their hands and seeing themselves before they went into the Hall of Holies was a vital, vital part of this ceremony and meant to draw attention to each one before they did so. So very good portion of, of scripture here um, for us to see. We see anything else there, Brother Nene? Oh, that's really, really good. And 
you brought me back uh, to the case where they are told to Moshe is commanded to make a brazen serpent, yeah, right? A uh, serpent made of bronze. And all along in the first covenant books, the children of Israel don't understand the implication of this brazen serpent. And actually, the prophets have to deal with this later on because it becomes a symbol of idolatry for them. So we only come to understand this brazen serpent through the cross, through Hamashiach being lifted up. That's when we come to understand it. And when you understand bronze in the scripture, it refers to the judgment, the process of judgment, right? Mm -hmm. And so when that snake is lifted up, when that bronze is lifted up, it reflects the sun. And so these people get to see that reflection, not, not really the serpent, but the reflection. Right. And so when we go to the cross, we have the chance to see that reflection, to receive judgment or rather to be purified and washed. And so it just interlinks with what you're saying and it's beautiful. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. Because, you know, we talk about seeing the reflection in the bronze as they wash their hands, knowing the judgment is coming <laughs> when they step behind that holy of holies. Because if they did not stand right before Yah, if there was unconfessed sin before they went into the holy of holies behind that veil, that's the reason that rope was tied around that inner thigh to drag them out because they dropped dead, right? So praise Yah. Um, very good picture, brother. I appreciate that. Um, Sister Lisa, brother Angel. Hi, Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Where, where do we see this, um, this uh, laver and um, Solomon's temple? And does it represent anything to do with uh, being immersed? just wondering um well th this particular was was the bowl that they would wash their hands with um, okay because i thought like when um solomon built the temple that it was a replica somewhat of this tabernacle so i was just wondering is it i was just wondering if it was the um the bowl they would wash with that had the oxen the with the four corner of uh, four um not corners an ox at each corner if it was the because i've seen a temple like a replica of the temple a diagram and i was like okay so i'm just wondering if this is what they're talking about um, this one let me see Well, let's read through it again. It says, then, then Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, you shall also make a laver of bronze with its um, base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. And you shall put water in it for Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet in the water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn the offerings made by fire to Yahuwah, they shall wash with water lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die and it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout the generation. So, um, um, I mean, could it be tied into baptism? Um, I mean, possibly. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I see that here specifically. Um, to me, this is, you know, a physical uh, cleansing, um, which, 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 which represents a purification. Um, but. Uh, I don't know something something that I that I can look into as far as um, what you're asking in relates in relation to Solomon's temple, um, because if it if so Solomon's would have been a replica of this, would have had the the laver uh, in the same exact place. Um, do you have a particular passage that you're talking about? 
No, it's just a thought I had because I had just seen the okay uh, pictures of the temple, so I was trying to just match it. Because that, am I right in that? Like, is it is it a replica of? It's supposed to match the tabernacle, like the area, like the temple, Solomon's temple, and the tabernacle have the same setup, right? Like, right. Okay. Uh, Sister Poppy and then Sister Diane. I have a question, if I may. Yes. Um, I know in the LDS church, they actually have a recreation of a the lever with the bulls on either or on the four corners holding it up. And that, I believe, is what they do baptisms. And is that like uh, horrible to recreate something like that? Um, what will be the purpose of recreating it for us? I, I, I don't know. I'm just wondering because I live in a very prominent LDS area. I'm wondering if that's something I could approach people um, about. I mean, they're probably just, they, they, you know, from, from, from my understanding, they will be doing it simply for ritual. You know, um, ca the Catholics have something similar too at the, in, right outside their sanctuary. Oh, you know, wow. filled with water. So it's it's a very common thing um, to have a laver type um, uh, model. The pre the, the Catholic priests wash their hands in it before they go into the sanctuary to do their service. So they're they're emulating what they're reading here, uh, basically. Um, I don't know that it's necessary for us. You know what I mean? You know, because for us, we're we're represent we're represented by the cleansing of the blood of Messiah. So we are cleansed. We have to remain so by making sure that we have short accounts of sin and confess sin. You know, making sure that I'm not going to pray for you, sister, if I got sin that's unconfessed. I'm not clean. I need to confess that sin. You know be back, turn back to Torah, you know, be on the straight and narrow before I can represent you, intercess for you, or else my prayers won't be heard. So um, it's all uh, uh, representing something that we now do. The cleansing before service, you know, the prayer, the confession of sin, being right before Yah, coming into his sanctuary, coming into his Shabbat. Like we come into his Shabbat, cleansed we want to we want to be cleansed of the stuff of that happened through the week where we missed the target forgive me oh yeah as i go into your holy shabbat from all of the times that i missed what you wanted me to me to do let me be refueled and re-educated so that i don't fall into those same things this coming week you know that is the representation of what we're seeing here we are now all priests you know of yah at this point. So, um, you know, a replication of that would only be ceremonial ritual only. It, it really has no significance other than it actually can clean your hands if you put your hands in the water with some soap. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but yeah, they're just emulating what they see in scripture. Um, Sister Diane. Shabbat Shalom, family. I'm Shabbat glad shalom. to see all the faces here today. What a beautiful lesson starting from this morning um, until now. Um, I would just like to say two things. Number one, it's amazing how um, some mm, religions can take the very word of Yahuwah and twist it to their own vain glory. For instance, uh, when we were reading about um, the given giving for a, the atonement of a soul. Um, when we were talking about that, the first thing that came to mind was uh, the Catholic church and how they would uh, charge people um, to have their sins removed. And, and, and not only their sins, but the sins of their family and, and even deceased ones. So um, 
you know, this, this, um, it's just amazing how they can take these scriptures and twist them around. But we know that Hasatan, you know, is really good for this. Um, I wanted to address this uh, laver. Um, the, the scripture that um, Sister Lisa um, is talking about, it would be found in um, 1 Kings 7 and 38. And it's actually referenced from um, Exodus 30 and 18. It actually references that. Um, however, the reference, 1 Kings 7 and 38, the lever is a lot bigger. So, yeah, it, it makes, you know, makes one wonder um, why did he? make it um, as large as he did if the one in Exodus was just for the cleansing, you know, washing your hand, like a, a face basin, pretty much. Um, so this, yeah, I just thought that was an, an, an interesting um, question and concept. I hadn't really thought of that before, but- You said uh, first went, Kings, what? Uh, seven and 38. All right, seven and 38. Then he made 10 lavers of bronze. Each laver contained 40 baths and each laver was four cubits. Um, on each of the 10 carts was a laver. And he put five carts on the right side of the house and five carts on the left side of the house. He set the sea on the right. Okay. Um, well, you know, in the case that you said, so everything was bigger that Solomon built. You know, the tabernacle he, he had was huge. You know, um, there is a difference in size. I actually was looking at, when we were going over the tabernacle, I saw some charts of the size difference between Solomon's um, and and what was, was done here in Exodus. So um, I'm gonna look into that more as, as to, to why it was the way it was. If anyone else knows, please, uh, chime in and you know what is interesting about that is that um he was given the dimensions for everything you know he, he didn't do any of this arbitrarily so it's it's uh definitely worth a study i mean it's just coming to my attention as well praise y'all absolutely thank you for uh, following up on that now now I understand what um sister lisa was asking about okay we'll look into that uh, brother Nene. Yeah, so we say Solomon, I think it's in Ecclesiastes, I'm not so sure you can remind me, correct me if I'm wrong. I can't, I, I can't hear you, brother. How about now? Yeah. I'm clearer? Yes. Yes. Uh, so I think it's in Ecclesiastes where Solomon tells us that if you go to the presence of Yah and you want to offer sacrifice and you remember that you have wronged your brother in any way, you know? So basically it's that cleansing that uh, here in Exodus we are told before we approach to burn offering, the tent of appointment or when we come near the altar. So it's both of those things. And when you are coming before the tent of appointment, that is in the presence of the Father, or to on the altar to offer sacrifices, and we realize we have any stain inside us, we need that washing, that cleansing, that leads us even to prevent ourselves from approaching that presence because we know we can face judgment there. So we refrain, go make our wrongs right, and then we can proceed. Praise you, praise you. I, I, I didn't hear everything you said, but I heard enough to 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 um to understand what you were saying. So praise you. Thank you for that, brother. Um, let's um let's move on. Let's uh, read on. Um, let's talk about the oil here. So let's go from verses twenty two to verse thirty three. 22 to 33, who wants to read that? 
I can read. I'll take that. Okay. Oh, okay, Yaakov, yeah, Yaakov was supposed to go next. And Lisa, you can take the last um, verses when we talk about Henson. Go ahead, brother. Moreover, Yahweh spake unto Moshe, saying, Take thou also unto three, three principal spices of pure mar, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calmas, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of, the, and of olive oil and hin. And thou shalt make it an oil of holy an ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. If it shall be an holy anointing oil, and thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all the vessels, and the candlestick and his vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all the, his vessels and the laver and his foot. And thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy. Whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aharon and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Yasharal saying, this shall be an holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generation. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall ye make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compounded anything like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall be cut off from his people. Man. <clears throat> There's that cut off again we talked about earlier. What you got, Yoko? No, it's it's just the 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 the, the, the instructions, the, the the details that Yahuwah gives to Moshe. There's a specific composition to the oil and the ingredients, and he he, he says that nobody shall try and make it or make anything like it for other for any other purpose other than what I have ascribed unto it. Yeah. And 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 you find everything that uh, everything that is holy, everything that Yahweh considers holy uh, in, in, in the nations, in in, in 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 what we call religion, is what is it's been used for other reasons than what it was ascribed for. Yeah. You find that with like the Sabbath, it is holy unto Yahuwah, but it is not being used for that. So that's what I get with the holy anointing oil and its specification. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think about, you know, incense, you know, like, I, you know, through, through my years, um, specifically, you know, my 20s, between the age of 20 and 30, or I would say even before that, between maybe 17 and 30, <clears throat> you know, incense were a big part of, of, of my life. Um, some, you know, some of times used to mask another aroma. <laughs> um, but I think, um, you know, just for me, the soothing and the nice smell, um, but, you know, here you're giving specific instructions not to, um, not to do this um, in the specific comp comp um, composition in this same way. Um, and, and, and you would be cut off, uh, put to death, it says. Um, and I, I found it interesting though, um, of how he says the art of the perfumer. And remember, this is going back to what we talked about before about the anointing and the gift of the person that is making what Yah told them to make, whether it be the seamstress, whether it be the bronze uh, 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 smith, the goldsmith, and here the perfumer, he had a skillful um, art that was sanctioned and holy 
to be done only by him, you know, for Yah. And, uh, you know, we looked at each, each utensil, the lampstand, the utensils, the altar of incense, all was to be consecrated, soaked in this oil. Um, so interesting for me to, to, to read through these things. Um, what do you guys see? Sister Lisa, you had your hand raised. Did you want to? Yeah, I was just going to comment on that as well, how he gave specific instructions on how to make this oil incense the compounds and then he's like but don't do it <laughs> so i just think that's i i'm i'm i probably i feel like people probably have done this oh, yeah. um i know a woman that does uh, a lot of with um oils and stuff essential oils and she said i made something like that but i didn't make that and so to me it, it felt wrong still yeah. so yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, nah, essential oils um uh are a big thing now. Um like we we my wife has diffusers and she puts essential oils in them. But I knew I knew people that made incense. You know, and they would make it with spices, they would make them with special oils. I've I've watched the process before. And I almost can guarantee you, Lisa, that I that someone tried to do this exact same concoction for sure. So definitely something wrong with that, um, as it tells us, uh, only to use it in this manner, right? So interesting. Anyone up, anything else on that? If not, um, Lisa, you can read the last uh, um, five verses, four or five verses. Okay, starting at 35, right? Yes, 34. Okay. Okay. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, take sweet spices, fra fragrant gum, and cinnamon, and galbanum, and clear frankincense with these sweet spices all in equal amounts. Then you shall make of these and... Oh, no. Actually, hold on. I turned the page. Oh, no. Hold on. I'm on my tablet. <laughs> Then you shall make of these an incense of compound, work of perfumer, salted, clean, set apart. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the witness in the tent of appointed where I meet with you. It is most set apart to you. And the incense which you make, do not make any for yourselves according to its composition. It is set apart to you for Yahuwah. Whoever makes any like it, to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. Again, I just I just see the same thing where um, he says not to do it. Um, let me see. And he says, you shall beat some very fine. Put it before the witness in the tent of appointed where I meet with you. Um, so where what is that about? That's probably my only question. Before the witness in the tent. So if you can break that down. Um, um, where are we at? Where? Okay. 36. Um, oh, before the testimony. That, that's the arc of the testimony. Okay, I see. Yeah. So, so this is an interesting portion of scripture beyond, you know, what we already talked about and what Lisa was sharing about replicating it as it tells us not to. It also tells me something about, yeah, like, so... This particular incense is for him. It's for him to smell. It's something that he enjoys. Um, and, you know, we jokingly talked earlier about what does our breath smell like? You know, what do we smell like? Not only what do we smell like, do we smell different? You know, obviously not physically, <laughs> but Figuratively speaking, this calls for those that are of him to be different, to be set apart, to be peculiar, to be not like the rest. Um, and I think it's something we need to pay attention to as we are offering ourselves, right? As we are 
the offerings, the incense, our prayers to him to be accepted? Is it different than the world? Is it different than the grandiose prayers that are done in the courtyards? Because that's not for him. You know, somebody spoke about that earlier, about these grandiose prayers that people pray that Yah doesn't require. Not only does he, or nor does he want, those aren't done for him. Those are for everybody else here. And so they can say, ooh, listen to how he prays. No, he wants a contrite heart pointed towards him. And I think, you know, when we read passages like this, we make the connection to his set apart people. We don't smell, we don't sound, we don't act, we don't talk like anyone else. We are chosen of Yah and we ought to act that way. We ought to respond that way. Um, so um, very good, very good section of scripture here. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting where I will meet you. It shall be most holy to you. But as for the incense, which you shall make you shall not make any for yourselves according to its composition. It shall be too, too holy. I'm sorry. It shall be to you holy for Yahuwah. Whoever makes any like it to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. Cut off. Put to death. Separated. Forever. So. Um, a lot of symbolism um, to actual meanings. Um, and we see Yahushua all through this being our intercessor, you know, for Yah, dying, cleansing us. It is, it is his blood that we're washed with. You know, someone talked about baptism earlier, the representation of the baptism, us dying with him and rising with him in this new life, our old man being put to death. We are, we are now a new creature um, for Yah. So praise Yah. Do we see anything else there? Sister Diane. You know, to me, that last verse ties up the whole day's teaching in that not only should we not make it my version, which is the King James version, says we shouldn't even make anything like it. Right. So for these people that say, well, I only use 85% of the ingredients or I only use 98% of the ingredients, uh, they're committing an abomination right there, you know. And um, to me, it, um, I can see an application even from this morning's lesson of uh, we have to be careful of what we think. We have to mm -hmm. protect our heart. We have to protect our mind. Um, when we're by ourselves, you know, these thoughts and things come in. But, you know, as a, as a group, as a corporate group, because some of these churches do this thing as well. As a corporate group, people can come together and um, create something like you know, um, um, a facsimile, you know, of a religion or a facsimile of an idea. And it just makes the whole thing wrong, like a little leaven leavens the whole lump per se. So, you know, this is something we have to be very careful of. And it also ties into the, the concept of adultery. You know, we're letting something um, infiltrate into our very being, you know, our very souls. Um, and he tells us, don't do that. You know, let our, you know, if he say don't do it, well, then we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't even do anything like it. And this ties into watching our tongues, watching what comes out of our mouths. You know, if we say that we are of the, the, the Ruach HaKadosh, then we should live according to the Ruach HaKadosh. And when we are pushing the Ruach HaKadosh to the side and we're allowing this, little bit to come in, you know, then we are going against his commandment to don't even do anything like it. Don't even appear, you know, it's what he tells us. Don't even, I can't call the, the description in verse 
Um, but I can see all of this um, tying in and everything has a purpose. The lever has a purpose. The brass uh, base, the, the brass lever has a purpose. It shows us ourselves. And it's not so much so that um, there was anything so particular about this incense outside of the fact that this is the incense that Yahuwah said is holy unto him. And the reason he, you know, I can see him saying that to the people is because the ingredients are there. It's like anybody can go out and get it. You know, it's not that they put together something and he comes in and just changed the chemical um, composition of that wasn't the case. But anyhow, um, at the reading of that last verse, I'm going like, wow, well, this this just ties in um, everything that uh, we've, we've had all day today. He said, don't even make anything like it. You know, don't even let don't even let the world come in. You know, this is mine. This belongs to me. You're mine. You're my creation. You belong to me. So don't let these things come in. You know, just so um, praise you on that. Hallelujah. Praise you. Praise you. No, I, I agree with you. This this whole day has tied in together from the message about the tongue and how it's used to everything we're reading today in in service to Yah, the altar of incense, you know, the ransom money, the bronze laver, the anointing oil, the incense themselves, all tie into us being, you know, um, fit for his service and, and how that all plays out um, and being obedient to him, JP. Go ahead, JP. <clears throat> I just want to um, also say that um, there's there's different, you know, we see the specific instructions that we just read, and, and that was specifically for the, the tabernacle or the uh, uh, the the altar and, and everything and we read. But there is an anointing oil, you know what I mean? And and that's something that would be separate, and I think specifically what was stated and what we read was for that particular you know those particular items and so because that's something that i've been definitely researching more on to understand you know like we see and because i was looking for it and i found in like first samuel 16 when david gets anointed you know he gets anointed with the oil right and so could that have been just olive oil you know what i mean um possibly or could have been some type of you know I don't know, I'm still researching it, but it's something to, to bring out because I think that when people are making something like we spoke of so specific right. Right. and getting these measurements and saying, oh, I'm going to make this and, and this is, and then they start to make an ex like some type of reasoning and say, well, we are the temple. So, you know, and my heart is the art and they start coming and then it creates it to be okay. And it's like, no, like that's separate of instructions for a specific of what Yahuwah stated. And so there is a difference between that and, and anointing oil. Like if you were to anoint your, your children or whatever you may um, decide. Very good point. There's a difference. And so, so JP was very clear about what he was saying, but just to, just to reiterate and to, to, to help with more clarity, he's specifically talking about the difference between what's instructed here and other places in scripture where oil was was created for the purpose of healing uh, the purpose of prayer stuff like that so so absolutely and, and very we should be very mindful of that that it's not all talking about the oil being created here uh in the instance here for the tabernacle so um very good point and you know because yeah People will get real goofy with it if you don't make those distinctions. You know what I mean? You'll be hearing all kinds of crazy stuff that is not scriptural, you know. So um, definitely, definitely pay attention to the instances in scripture that are different from 
what's happening here at the Tabernacle. Praise God. Yeah. Well, great study, guys. Um, I was gonna um, we'll stop there, and then we'll we'll do uh, we'll do two chapters next week, thirty-one and thirty-two. We can knock out. So, praise Yah. Um, read ahead, and we'll um, we'll pick up here next week, and. Um, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Akuti, and Rohim. Thank you so much for viewing this video. We hope it was helpful to your walk in the truth. Remember to always search the scriptures on your own, to study Abba's word, and show yourself approved according to 2 Timothy 2.15. We invite you to study with us. To join us in a live study, just go to our website at assemblyofyahuwah.com and click the Join Us tab. We have something available Wednesday through Saturday of every week. If you've been Baruch or blessed by this video today or any other study, we encourage you to go to the Giving tab on our website. Our elders all have their own ways of income, so none of the giving or proceeds go to them. Instead, it goes to biblical assembly needs. We also encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any new videos. We sincerely pray that Abba continues to direct your path as you acknowledge Him in all your ways. Much avaha and again shalom.